approaches to citizen science in a transition to open science. We will talk specifically about institutional opportunities and challenges for creating an open and inclusive environment for research with regards to citizen science. So this is a two day workshop and today we will focus on the institutional approach. Um, before we start, some housekeeping rules. Let's see if I can go to the second slide. Yes. So unfortunately, all participants are muted and your video is turned off. This is because we have a lot of participants and we want to keep it a bit orderly. If you want to tweet, you can use the uh, hashtags or tweets of AOI and Open Air as shown there. If you have any questions or comments about the presentations or the topics presented here, please use the Q&A box. This way we can uh, have an overview of all the questions and the questions will be addressed after the presentations if there's time and otherwise there's a dedicated Q&A time at the end of uh, the presentations. We also would like to hear your opinion. Uh, we have a mentee, uh, some menti questions prepared for you. Again, there will be time during the Q&A time at the end. But if you already want to have a look, you can go to menti.com and give in the code 8257153. If you have any other things to say, any technical issues, you can use the chat box. And I also like to note that this session is, be is being recorded. The recordings and the slides will be made available through YouTube and Zenodo, but we will also send out a tweet when they are available and we will send you an email with uh, all the available information and where you can find the slides and recordings. So as said, today we will talk about citizen science in an institutional context and I don't want to take up more of your time, so uh, I would like to pass the word to Jean-Pierre Finance and Inge van Nieuwenburg for the introduction. Okay. <clears throat> Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, webinar jointly organized, as Emily said, by uh, Open Air and uh, EUA on the uh, university approach to citizen science in the transition to open science. This topic is becoming more and more important, particularly in this context of pandemic crisis needing to uh, step up, uh, speed up, sorry, uh, both citizen uh, science and uh, open science. Just to remember you that uh, EUA is a European University, is the European University Association with uh, 840 members and uh, it's more than uh, uh, EU uh, because there is uh, 48 uh, countries associated uh, through into uh, EUA. Next slide. Next, please. Okay. Uh, university in Europe are exploring and uh, promoting the potential of citizen science to expand public participation in science and support alternative models of knowledge production. As we said, uh, we'll say uh, Professor Muki Akle, with uh, our today's uh, keynote speaker. In fact, uh, numerous projects and a small but growing number of initiatives are leading the way, showing the benefit of engaging citizens into various uh, stages of research. However, citizen science is rarely part of uh, institutional mission nor approaches to academic uh, career assessment. In short, it's not common part uh, of the academic culture. It will be key to provide support, incentives, and rewards to encourage institutions and academic staff to pursue citizen science. Next. Yes, okay. Uh, uh, European research area. Renewed by the European Commission and EU member states in 2020, continue building a common European uh, research and innovation landscape, broader vision for the new era while uh, deepening uh, existing priorities and objectives. And in this context, the topic of citizen science is high 
on the EU policy by the introduction, uh, introducing uh, citizens' engagement in research as part of the process, specifically for its potential to achieve greater impact and increase trust, trust in science. And the pandemic context, as I said, uh, show it's necessary to improve this relationship between a society and a science. EUA, for its side, believe that citizen science can be a valuable part of the broader transition to open science, opening the research process and uh, bringing its outcomes closer to the society. Thus, uh, EUA has provided the policy input uh, of the new area, including the need to support incentive and reward citizen science. Before leaving the floor to my colleague and friend Inge van Nie Verberg, I would like next just to remember the next uh, the current uh, open access uh, open science uh, survey uh, lead sent by EUA. Uh, aiming to gather a comprehensive view of strategic and operational development by university in the transition to open science. And the topics include uh, specifically open access for sure, fair data sharing, but also citizen science, open education, etc. And uh, I would like just to remember that uh, this access to the survey is still open, the deadline, deadline between uh, extended, it be, being extended to the 15th January 2021. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I would like uh, to send the floor to uh, Inge. Inge. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, thanks a lot, Jean-Pierre. Um, so this is a, a workshop which is co-organized by the EUA and Open Air, and, uh, and it's in the context of open science, uh, which we have seen lately in the last few months. Uh, open science plays an important role in uh, the current conditions we have to do research in and how to disseminate information. Um, but I just uh, want to highlight again that why we find open science so uh, important. Uh, well, science just doesn't happen uh, in the lab alone. It, it's part of our everyday life. And we want to engage the public. We want to engage people in research and show them how uh, and include them in the process uh, and, and the importance, show them the importance of science. It, uh, research is a part of a wider ecosystem. So it's a, an innovation process, it's an eco academic ecosystem, but embedded in uh, society and there is a social responsibility. So a dialogue, interaction is needed and uh, citizen science is of course an uh, important uh, part there. Um, open science is about trust, it's about reproducibility, it's about transparency, it's about uh, accountability, it's involving everyone into this dialogue. Now, uh, open air uh, for more than 10 years is an open access infrastructure for research in Europe. And uh, we support open science in many different ways in uh, social uh, interaction, uh, in technical uh, solutions, um, we support open and reproducible science. Uh, communication is key here, of course. And uh, with open air, we have uh, a broad, uh, broad tasks and broad services that we provide. Uh, there are national open access desks in every European country. But what you see next to all the things uh, that we do here and all the people that we get together, there is also a citizen science part in, uh, in open air. So that is why we together with EUA uh, do this workshop. So we uh, are working on services, uh, practically, uh, uh, very practical for people to use, but we uh, are involved in aligning policies uh, and uh, we are in, uh, have a lot uh, of training for people uh, to get involved in open science. 
As said, there is a, a network of national open science desks, so uh, you can have a look uh, who is a national open access desk in your country, you can always contact us, but we are embedded in the world and uh, you, we have a lot of interaction with international, um, with international organizations all over the world. Now, this is just uh, as an introduction and welcome to this workshop. I will leave the floor now to, um, and I'll stop sharing my screen. I will uh, leave the floor now to speakers that will uh, inform you and get you excited about uh, citizen science, but also uh, want to discuss how we approach that in the university context. And we will start with two speakers, two professors with different backgrounds to give their view on citizen science in, in respect to their discipline. Uh, our first speaker is Professor Muki Hakle, um, who is a very uh, well known when we talk about uh, citizen science. And of course, uh, uh, he will also be in his um, discipline, which is geographic information science. Uh, he works at the University College London, and there he's also the core director of the UCL Extreme Citizen Science Group. I would like the name Extreme Citizen Science Group. So he is very experienced in the subject. Um, and uh, afterwards, uh, I will give the word to Professor Alexander Refsum Jensenius. Sorry, Alexander. Um, he is a music researcher and research musician. So that's uh, in, the, in the humanities. Uh, uh, sciences, and um, he is uh, an associate professor, uh, a professor at the Department of Musicology of the University of uh, Oslo. He is a member of the expert group at EOA um, Open Science, so he sees the um, connection with open science and wants to talk about that as well. So without further ado, I'll leave the floor to Professor Heckley. Please uh, go ahead. Thank you, Inge and Jan Pierre, for the uh, introduction, your very kind words. What I'm going to spend the next 30 minutes on is give you, I'm sure that there are some people here who kind of have some ideas about citizen science, but not complete understanding. So in order to bring us all into a common understanding, I will try to cover the different aspects of citizen science activities and kind of talk about why we are seeing it and where it came from. But I'll do that by using examples from my own university, UCL, to demonstrate how different activities come together in order to build up the landscape. And then I'll talk also about the learning and what it's the relevance for research but also the challenges and opportunities for universities, which will be our last part. So the first thing to notice is that in the past 10 years, we have seen a rapid growth in awareness to citizen science. This is just one example from Scopus, which demonstrates this rapid increase in a, a recent analysis of papers demonstrated that papers on citizen science increase in a more rapid pace than uh, the general increase in academic papers. So why is it happening and why we are suddenly paying attention for it? What is happening when we are looking around the world in different citizen science activities, we are seeing over-representation of people with higher education, people with uh, university degrees. We'll deal with, with other groups later on. But when you're opening citizen science, the re what happened over the past two decades is that we increased massively the number of people who are going through tertiary degrees and all our universities have benefited from it. There is now at this moment over 2.5 million people studying for a PhD degree. And that general level of population, that kind of transition means that many more people in society understanding what the scientific process is, even if they are not involved with it day in, day out in the work, but we, uh, within working in a more scientific society, we have many more people that can join and are interested in uh, scientific processes and activities. 
And that combined with the technological development, which a lot of people are raising uh, within the framework of uh, citizen science, so the web, the mobile, the sensing devices that we will see, all of them has come together and increased the uh, range and activities of citizen science. But let's look at both citizen science and the history uh, at UCL. At, uh, and the history is actually going back into the 1980s and even before with a lot of interest on public participation in research, a lot of it within the social sciences. And uh, we'll see one example later on of that early experiment. But a clear growth over the past decade, which you'll see signposting. And it's crossing a lot of disciplinary boundaries. We will see it in medical, in health, in engineering, life science, uh, physical sciences, earth science, geography, social science, humanities, all these areas. And that also uh, raises a challenge, which we'll note later on. And we also see a growing community of researchers and practitioners with knowledge in the field. So in each of these fields, people started calling those activities in different names, and it took the, those two decades for them to say, hey, you're doing something like me, and let's start sharing the knowledge and agree what it is that we are doing. So if we look at citizen science, we kind of can look at different areas, and this is a typology from a paper from 2018, which you can find online, of course, open access. Uh, and the First area is the area of long running citizen science, where citizen science never disappeared from the agenda of researchers. There is like ecology and biodiversity where volunteers continue to collect data and sharing it, or meteorology where weather observation continue to come from a wide range of volunteers, or archeology span where people participated in excavations. So the example from UCL in 2007 is the big large scale open air laboratory, which was funded notice by the big lottery fund, not by a research funder. And that project was running for 10 years and engaged million children over those years. And there are fantastic output from it, open air laboratory or OPAL was also at the basis of the establishment of the European Citizen Science Association. At UCL, there was work around designing experiment with water where the model was to ask um, school children to collect data and then the scientists are the one to analyze it, but the children are actively participating in the analysis. Another area is citizen cyber science, where that's an area of citizen science that would not be possible without the internet and computing resources. So that includes things like volunteer computing, where people put in software on their phone or on their computer and uh, actively participating in scientific process by processing data and allowing cloud scale processing uh, of, of different experiments. An example of that is a project of uh, creating a analysis of nanotubes for water filtering, which was run uh, with Tsinghua University, but also with some engagement of the UCL, um, nano, the London Nanotechnology Center, which is at UCL. Another example of that is OpenStreetMap. This is actually an amazing bottom-up project that started by an undergraduate at UCL after he finished his studies. And he needed access to map data, but that was not available. So because GPS was already available and there was ability to share information online, he set out uh, the system that will create a Wikipedia of maps. So people now can access all this data openly and uh, it produced massive amount of papers. Um, it's also for me a personal experience of being very nice to an undergraduate while you're doing your PhD because he then handed over the paper on OpenStreetMap which became one of my top cited papers. So always be nice to undergraduate as a PhD student. Another example 
is that um, to inscribe Bentham, which is in the uh, digital humanities area. And it started in 2009 and asking the public to contribute through uh, transcribing the writing of Bentham. And his writing is absolutely horrendous to transcribe. And indeed, there are really skilled people that are involved in it, people with legal experience. And actually, it's one of the projects that a review of it showed that many of the participants hold the PhD. Another example in the volunteer thinking area where we are using cognitive abilities is the uh, uh, Feynman Flowers which was a project at the London Center for Nanotechnology, which I mentioned earlier. And it actually used different uh, scanning of atoms in order to analyze a specific pattern. It's similar to now what we see in a lot of the Zooniverse project, and there is similarity between that. There are also examples of passive sensing project, where in passive sensing, those are projects where you use the similar ability to the volunteer computing, so ability to run a process on the computer, but you use some sensing ability. And a great example from UCL was the pandemic experiment, which ran as part of the BBC, where people were asked to download the software and to uh, check with their Bluetooth who they see. And the information that came out of this uh, experiment was contributing to the UK modeling of the pandemic at, an, at the early stages. It's an, a project with clear and direct impact. The final type of activities in citizen science that we look at are community science. So those are more community oriented with much higher level of participation by the people who are involved in it. And actually that's the area where we talk more about empowerment, although that exists in all area, because you give more power away to the participant. And I mentioned the work uh, in the 1980s, and this is actually the pedigree of my own work uh, that started from uh, activities where uh, researchers at the Department of Geography were pioneers in using focus groups uh, in and participatory approaches to engage uh, deprived communities in uh, understanding their green spaces. And while I was doing my own PhD, I was working with different communities, building on this research and engaging people in understanding uh, environmental information. So I was interested in public access to environmental information. And because it wasn't available online, we had to drag people all the way to UCL uh, in order to see and explore this information. What was fascinating is that people without any experience of using computer before, people in their 60s who never touched a mouse, during this workshop were identifying information that was for them inaccurate and didn't match their local knowledge. And therefore they insisted on taking it, learning the mouse and the keyboard and starting to uh, update the information. So contributing to information. With the advent of the uh, smartphone, there were activities that fall into the participatory sensing. So this is uh, a project that was run under the FET open uh, program of uh, FP7. And uh, within this every aware project, there was an app that was used to record the level of noise in different parts of the city. And it was used quite extensively around Heathrow. Today, there is another project that run by a social enterprise that is associated with uh, our group, Mapping for Change, who is involved in a project, a European project, the noses that uh, measure for other observatories. But activities of sensing and community engagement also happen in the social sciences. So there is a fascinating social citizen social science happening by the Institute of Global Prosperity, where they are engaging people within East London in discussing what type of issues they want to explore, 
what does it mean to have prosperity and they are actively involved, not just in defining it, but also in measuring it. Another areas that engage people quite heavily is within the DIY science, when people are building their own devices. So like this uh, humidity and temperature sensor that you see here, or people building their own network or flood modeling. This is an example of the power of citizen science. If a researcher want to install a flood network, they will need to consider issues like where they install it, how many times they need to go back to the place in order to um, change the batteries, how the communication will work and so on. But when people put it at the end of their garden and using their own Wi-Fi, and the device is beeping when they need to change a battery so they change it, all these problems go away. Plus you have access to places that regularly it's very complex to access, such as people's backyard. And another fantastic example that came out from an iGEM competition from the International Genetically Engineering Machine competition is the Bento Lab, where uh, two, peer, two students from UCL were setting out and understanding that there is a value in carrying out PCR uh, analysis at home on a device that is uh, the size of about a laptop. And they started working also through crowdfunding on Bento Lab, which you now can find online and you can use it in different ways. And it was even, again, relevant within our current situation. And we get now into the work of my own group again about uh, working with non-literate groups in different parts of the world, in Cameroon, in uh, Brazil, and so on, and creating a participatory tool where the icons that you see on the screen have been co-designed and agreed with the community through a free and pre-informed consent process. And then that data is being collected and shared, for example, with a logging company to ensure that the area that they are important to the community will not be harmed during the logging process. Or another example that they now working together with the Institute of Global Prosperity work in the Masai Mara and with local researchers is identifying over 170 types of trees and uh, creating a system where they go around and collect information about the uh, health or problems that exist in different trees and that information is then used in combination with artificial intelligence and a satellite imagery in order to help and assess the condition of the ground and deal with climate change adaptation. There is also a whole emerging area out of all this work, which you can call the science of citizen science, this amazing growth in understanding what are the aspects of citizen science. So you find yourself in a situation where citizen science is its own transdisciplinary area, where people are understanding, for example, in an important paper that came from our human computer interaction researchers, on what are the different aspects of design for different people that participate in volunteer thinking, or a major book that came out in uh, uh, just two years ago about citizen science. It came out of the UCL Open Access Press, which was a delight to work with, and therefore is accessible and you can find it with all its chapters. Or the fact that we are now running an MSc level course, Introduction to Citizen Science and Scientific Crowdsourcing, which my group run. And we run it actually in parallel on the open course platform of UCL, UCL Extend. And we allow anyone who wants to join the course while we are teaching it in class to join in and see it online. This is now leading to the creation of an MSc program in Citizen Science and Scientific Crowdsourcing which will open its door in uh, 2022. And finally, out of all this work, we now have the support of the UCL Office of Open Science and Scholarship, which was launched in uh, October, 
and it includes the mission of dealing with citizen science. But let's notice something really important already we're noticing that citizen science exists across discipline. I've just demonstrated to you that it's working from humanities to social science to uh, nanotechnology. And that means that there isn't one discipline that will work with it. And when we consider that public engagement in general is a minor activity of many researchers. So there are too many researchers who are not even involved at basic level of public engagement. Some research at UCL demonstrated, uh, at, sorry, at the UK demonstrated that uh, over 80% of researchers are not even sharing on social media when they are publishing something. So that means that and explains why the people that are working within the field of citizen science are coming together from across discipline to develop this understanding of the science of citizen science and how to promote their own work. We also see different issues in terms of the, pub, of the participant engagement. We've seen examples of different use of technology. Not everything need to be uh, based on uh, smartphones and apps. Sometimes the app is the wrong thing to do. And there are different levels of knowledge. We've seen that in some project, it's appropriate to uh, recruit people with a PhD, while in other projects, you can work with people who don't read and write. So that all led to the creation of different association. Already eight years ago, there was both in Europe and in the US interest in creating collaboration of different people that are doing citizen science, which led to the creation of the Citizen Science Association, the European Citizen Science Association, the Australian, and now we are seeing also the emergence of the African and the Asian, and there is also one in Latin America. But moreover, we are now also seeing national networks emerging where researchers are sharing information about their own place in networks like in uh, Denmark, in um, Germany, in Spain, uh, and some networks are growing in other countries as well. And what we're getting through these networks are valuable things like early on, the European Citizen Science Association came up with the extra 10 principles of citizen science, which help researchers in the area of best practice of identifying what is a good citizen science. And that can also help in managing and understanding how a citizen science should work. Like notice, for example, that it needs to be genuine science outcome, but we're not saying exactly the detail of a certain outcome, because in some cases that will mean a paper in nature and science. In other cases, it will mean creation of a database like the OpenStreetMap. But because the uh, principles are somewhat vague and more about the best practice, a recent effort of EXA led to the creation of the characteristics of citizen science. That's a document that is uh, going to help policymakers at different levels from at the university or in funding organizations and in other places to identify what type of activity should be called citizen science. Both documents are available on Zenodo. And in the case of the characteristics, there is also an expanded uh, explanation document and currently working on an open access paper that will um, provide the background and the rationale behind it. So now I'll end the last part about the opportunities and the challenges in research with citizen science. So what are the opportunities? Within research, we have the co-production of knowledge. That is something that for me, who's been doing that for 20 years, it's fantastic. It's the way I'm doing things. I'm very happy not to assume that I know more than the people that live in the neighborhood. And I can show them the statistical information that we have from the outside, but I'll ask for their interpretation. 
because a lot of time as an external researcher, I won't have the right interpretation about this thing. I can suggest things, but not always understand it. But it requires you to give away the power of control over the project, and some researchers do find it challenging. It also allows you to engage and include voices that are missing in scientific research. And that is something that is critical to make research relevant to society. We too many times, and I can point to different decisions that are being made in Britain that demonstrate the lack of understanding of different voices in different lives of minorities, of people that are not within the socioeconomic status of researchers and so on. It allows us coverage and scope, as I demonstrated to you, with both OpenStreetMap and the flood mapping, you wouldn't be able to do the research otherwise. It's impossible to try and coordinate accessing 500 people backyards with citizen science, you can. It also allows you to create a societal impact and allow you to access resources that would be how to reach otherwise. The level of computing that uh, volunteer computing provides is unprecedented in terms of the ability of doing calculation in different areas. So that aspect led to awareness, both in the US since 2016, there is a, a bill called the Citizen Science and Crowdsourcing Act that follow a memorandum from the chief scientist of the US. In Europe, we have this, of course, in the LAMI report, but now within also the regulations of Horizon Europe, where citizen science is mentioned as a cross-cutting theme, and the principle of citizen science, including citizen science, are now noted. And the recent uh, brochure that came out of the uh, commission with the support of uh, Maria Gabriel on this area. And we're already seeing different activities in the area. This is from an analysis a year ago by the uh, commission of looking at which project are engaging with it. Now, we don't have the total number, of course, of project in each of the column, which would give us a better analysis. So for example, my own ERC project is one of those 14 projects, but when we think about the total number, this is still a small minority. Same thing can be said about the Marie Curie uh, fellowships and so on. So we're seeing a starting of it, but not extensive use of it. And to uh, finish our talk, we also need to notice different levels of engagement from people that are involved at a um, very small level. So we can see it as part of a spectrum of, um, of public engagement. So we can think about everyone in society. We can think about people who are passively consume, consume science, like watching a TV program, or uh, just reading a news article. Then we can think about active consumption of science, going to a science show or going to a museum and so on. Above that, you start getting engaged in citizen science. For example, there is once a year, a project in the UK where you go and watch birds for one hour a year and report it to the RSPB. This project has managed to reach out 500,000 people. That's the ability of reaching huge amount of people and contribute to the data. Above that, you start involving in deeper tasks and spending more of your time. And the number of people that are involved in the IOI science is very small. And we can also think about the, on each citizen science project that we actually need to balance between those different goals. So while I talked about projects that are engaging PhD, uh, people with PhDs and other projects that engage with uh, people who are non-literate, they require different resource and different attention. And you can't achieve all the goals at once. So you always need to balance the different goals. A major challenge within the area of citizen science is of course funding. And we have to notice that to this day, 
um, the level of funding that this area are getting, despite of the societal impact, is still not significant enough, which is why recently I am calling for, let's be ambitious, let's think about 10 or 20 percent of uh, the similar budget of what is going on to CERN, because with the size of budget, which we are talking about 150 or 300 million a year, we could reach massive amount of European population. So to uh, summarize what we noticing about citizen science in university, it's an enabled research that is not possible otherwise. It addressed the need for societal impact. It's also contributed to the mission across different activities. We've seen example in the teaching, we've seen the example in research, we've seen example in outreach. We have seen example that it's in cutting edge science. There are ERC projects that are doing that in the frontiers of science, but it's crossing all disciplinary boundaries. And therefore the support to it need to be seen as part of infrastructure, which is why, for example, at UCL, I strategic analysis demonstrate that the library is a really good host or some other body that cross across the different faculty. Otherwise, we will cover just part of the activity. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Professor Lickley. Um We have some questions coming in, but I uh, we will address them uh, to the end of this session uh, when uh, after the panel, and then we can uh, address many of these questions. Uh, thanks again, Professor Heckley. Now we turn over to Professor uh, Alexander Refsum Jensenius. Now we go more, uh, we will talk more about some challenges, ch challenges of, of citizen science for universities. It's all yours. Thank you very much. Um, I will talk about uh, challenges. I will talk about some opportunities as well, if I'm allowed to do that. And, and thanks a lot also to the very nice presentation by, by Muki to, to kind of frame this. Um, I will dig in a little bit more into a few specific things. And also from the perspective of working at the university where we have some examples of, of citizen science, but not a very kind of uh, strategic approach to it. So um, a few things about myself first. So I'm, I'm working uh, then um, on this from the perspectives of both being a music researcher and a research musician. And also, so that's kind of the more kind of the bottom up approach, um, but also then from running a lab and a center and also being involved in various, various types of, of policy making from the top. So I, I kind of try to kind of unite the the kind of the top and the, the bottom perspectives in, in this presentation. And I should also mention that I, I often prefer to talk about open research instead of open science. And that's particularly because I'm uh, coming from the arts and humanities where also um, the science, the concept of science uh, doesn't always fit with what we're doing. So, so I may mix up these two terms in a little bit in, um, in the presentation. Um, just to kind of briefly to talk about the kind of the, the concept of open research, as, as you know, the, the idea here is that we, we are trying to figure out how to open the research process more. So as it has traditionally been, you start with kind of an idea, um, then you write an application and, and then you do the research and then you have some kind of output. And, and usually the, the application and the research part, they have been kind of black boxes and the output part is well, kind of grayish. We are doing more open access, we're opening publications, et cetera, but it's still not entirely open. And within, within this kind of timeline and, and kind of framework for doing research, then we have all the different components of, of open uh, research that you can see here, where uh, you can see citizen science as being kind of one of these blocks. If you think about citizen science more as being kind of a methodological approach to how you collect data, but also as we just heard, I mean, you can also think about citizen science more as kind of encompassing approach where the idea is really to, to be able to kind of think about all the different elements of the, the, the the research process and, and figure out how we can get citizens involved in, in this. Um, so the question then is how, how do you do that and, and how, how do you go about doing it? And um, I think I'll, I will try to give then a couple of examples from my own from my own research. So you could also call it citizen research in, in terms of citizen science. But anyways, let's keep to the, the science part here. So, so I have two kind of cases that I will present briefly here now and then I'll draw up some, some of the challenges uh, that I've experienced from, from doing these. 
So let's start with this one called the Lading in Norwegian. Um, and this one is, is coming out of my research interest in studying how the human body uh, is involved in music making of different kinds. And uh, more specifically over the last few years, I've been interested in, in really trying to understand more about if music actually makes people move, because it's, we often say that music moves us, but, but is, that really, is that really the case? So we have been running a lot of uh, experiments in my motion capture lab where we have people coming into the lab and we ask them to stand still and we play music to them and we measure them with different types of systems and, and then look at how they move and, and if they move more when they listen to music. And then, of course, running doing this in a controlled lab environment in kind of a more traditional uh, research setting is, is very good. We get very good quality of the, of the data, etc. But of course, the challenge here is that we are uh, not able to get very many participants in, in here because it's, it's a very time consuming way of doing things. So then um, one way to get more participants into this was uh, that we some years ago started up uh, the Norwegian Championship of Standstill, which is a competition where people would come to our lab and the task is, is then really to, to stand still on the floor and, and we play music to them and we measure what they're doing. Uh, and then we also uh, have a winner coming out of this. So it's, it's a way of kind of engaging the public um, in this. And we've been running this championship annually. And this has provided us with, with lots of nice data that we have also made publicly available in the Oslo Standstill database with now more than 600 recordings of people standing still while listening to music. So this is still not really perhaps citizen science, it's more about just kind of attracting more people. So then how, um, how can we really get people more involved with, in this? Well, one approach that we have made is to, to try to see how we can also uh, share the data with people and also involve people in doing analysis on this data. So we, uh, we develop software that we make available on, on GitHub. We also make this Jupyter notebooks where people can go in and edit and come up with different types of interpretations of the, their own data and, all, and also uh, other people's data. All of this is anonymous, of course, so uh, in terms of privacy. But then, um, how can we go even further and get even more um, data in here? Um, and then uh, we teamed up with a company called Jan Lading uh, that develops educational software for schools. And the idea here was to, to see if we can try to get uh, also data from, from school children around the country. So we made this case study that we can kind of uh, would be, be distributed to teachers. And the teachers would then take this into the classroom and then do this exercise with the kids where they were standing still in the classrooms, listening to music, and then they would answer some questions. So we get some quantitative, quantitative data uh, collected from the teachers, but we also get these drawings where the kids would also draw um, how it felt like standing still in silence and how it felt like standing still with music. So this is a very nice uh, data set that we have gotten now where we're still getting lots of these. So we get lots and lots of data, which is a very nice thing. Um, but on what we see is that um, the quantitative data that we get from the forms are very simple and, and are so generic that it's not really so easy to get things out of it. And the qualitative data that we get are very messy. So that's kind of a few methodological challenges that we need to, to continue working on. More from the institutional perspective, we see that it's a bit tricky to rely on, on an external partner when it comes to kind of distributing this, these cases and, and kind of collecting information. Uh, so we have very limited control on the data collection itself. And we have no control on the selection of participants for this. So both of these kind of lead to different types of bias, which we need to kind of take into account as well. So that's kind of the summarizing some of the, the, the things that we, we got out of this type of, of doing kind of data collection from a citizen science perspective. Now, let me now turn to another case that we've been running called Music Lab, which is a little bit more elaborate and, and a little bit larger and when it comes to kind of engaging people. So, uh, this is a, a collaboration between uh, my research center, RITMO, and the university library here in, in, in Oslo, where we teamed up and, and tried to think about the concept where you can really try to open the entire process and get people involved from the start. So the whole idea here is to build a um, music lab through uh, as, as, as um, one, one concept, uh, an event, where we have one research question that we want to kind of uh, answer. And everything then is built around a concert, a public concert, um, where uh, we will test out this, this research question. So for each of the events, we also organize then a workshop in the, in the day where we present some methodology, invite everyone that wants to come to, to participate in this. Um, we run a panel discussion also prior to the event where we discuss with both researchers and also um, other people involved in, in, 
in, in the topic uh, about different things. We do data collection of the musicians, but also all the audience during the, the concert. So we invite everyone to participate there. And then we do data jockeying at the end of the event, where uh, the idea is that we will share the data straight away and have people then uh, actually do live data analysis um, as part of the event itself. Of course, all the data and everything around this event uh, is shared uh, openly. Yeah, just some pictures from from some of these events. Um, they have been usually been been going on all day with kind of this uh, evening event, where there's also this kind of social component to to this. So we have been running several of these uh, music labs now and have gained quite a lot of experience. And what we see is that what we thought of as kind of just kind of a way of, of opening the research process has led to also a lot of other types of of solving various things. So. First of all, we had kind of to work on the concept development, how to really do these type of things uh, in the first place, and particularly from kind of an arts and humanities perspective, how we can kind of think about uh, including uh, including kind of a way of asking questions and, and, and collecting data that is actually meaningful from our perspective. There's a lot of problem solving going on in terms of just making this happen at all. Um, we also seen that this leads to publications on its own uh, coming out of this, just on kind of developing all of this. And then, of course, also the infrastructure development that we also are part of. And just a few words about some of these. So on the problem solving side, privacy is a major issue for us and is something that we have been discussing a lot. Um, and this is a general uh, problem when you're dealing with, with research on humans, uh, and particularly after also GDPR. Uh, and uh, it's, it's also then escalating in, in kind of in complexity when you're dealing with, with kind of also opening the entire process and, and involving citizens at, at all uh, levels. Uh, we also have the uh, issue of copyright where uh, everything we are dealing with some, have some kind of, of copyright. So it's, it's also problematic to, to solve that, particularly when you want kind of to, to share things again openly. On the infrastructure side, um, we have the, the challenges of both storage and archive. And I'll mention these two, uh, uh, these two challenges a little bit more because it, it, not everybody thinks about this. So an archive is, is uh, usually somewhere where you store something for kind of long-term preservation. And this is typically something that libraries uh, are, are dealing with. Storage, on the other hand, when it comes to kind of working on active data, is something that typically IT organizations are working with. And in my experience, the, unfortunately, there is kind of still quite a big gap between the kind of the storage and the archive side of things here. So what we are working on now is to develop this Music Lab app for data collection, where people will be able to answer questions. And we also do data collection of, on people's bodies by looking at how they move. Um, and we're doing this in such a way that people can download and use this app, and then we will uh, safely store the data on the University of Oslo service so they can we abide to GDPR and, and the privacy. And um, there, of course, we also have a, a good way of, of the researcher uh, researchers being able to work with the data. More challenging then is to have uh, citizens getting access to our uh, internal secure storage at the university and try to figure out uh, streamlined uh, ways of doing that. And also then to solve the archival part here, how can we actually then create a good transfer of, of data from, from storage to archive with uh, persistent IDs and everything else that, would, that kind of makes this uh, work properly. So to try to kind of summarize some of the more challenging part here and, and kind of the, some of the institutional challenges as well that I've uh, learned from, from, from doing these type of, of experiments then with both the Jan Lading and the Music Lab cases. Um, uh, we have the need for develop more technical infrastructure uh, at, at all levels. Uh, we need channels for connecting to citizens from an institutional perspective. How to actually do this is, is some, still something that, at least in, at my university, we don't really have a, a, a strategic way of doing. We need more legal support. Um, there is so many questions when it comes to privacy and copyright uh, that we need to handle at, kind of at, the, at the bottom level. Uh, we need more and better data management support, and particularly the way of how to share things, uh, not only be able to store it on a secure server. Um, we also need to have strategies for avoiding bias and pressure uh, when it comes to this, this data that we collect. Um, and uh, of course, we also need incentives and rewards so that people are actually interested in, in doing all of this. So 
Um, we need to develop policies. That's, of course, important. Um, and that's also what's going on very, very many places now. But it's also very important to connect this kind of uh, uh, top down uh, way of working with also kind of more bottom up approach. So we need more pilot projects to really try things out and have more researchers to get their hands dirty on really testing it. OK, I think that's what I wanted to, to say today. Um, thank you very much. Thanks uh, a lot, uh, Alexander. Um, so as said before, we I have seen many questions coming in in the Q and A. Um, we will certainly address some of them. Some of them will be answered probably in the panel, and some of them will be answered later on in the, the Q and A and discussion at the end. Now, before we move on to the panel, Irina, we have a few Mentimeter questions to throw in and to hear how things are going on at your university. Um, so you. Maybe we can show the slide again for the Mentimeter, the information for the Mentimeter. We wanted to uh, ask you a few questions. And thanks a lot for starting answering them already. So we have 20 responses. Um, can we show the slide again? Um, it's menti.com, right? I'll, uh, we can type it in. Uh, in the chat box. I'll show the, the yeah, slide again. Thank you. Let's see. Okay. My screen. And I put a link in the, in the chat, which yeah, should thanks. point you directly to this Mentimeter. So uh, please go ahead and go to menti.com, enter the code, and we would like to hear uh, what you have to say about the questions. Irina, will we look at some answers uh, later on or do you already want to say something about it? It's after, after the panel. Okay, thank you. Um, then we go to the panel where probably some of your questions will be answered. And the panel uh, will be led by uh, Professor Daniel Weiler. He's uh, also a member of the EUA Open Science Expert Group. So I'll be very will be uh, discuss open science uh, questions and he will uh, lead this panel. Daniel, I'll give the floor to you. Okay, thank you very much, Inge. I fear my connection is not so good and you may only be but maybe that's even better, so. Um, okay, uh, the panel uh, consists of distinguished uh, practitioners and people of citizen science. So we have Muki Hautlai, who, whom you have seen already, you have heard. I don't need to add anything. He, he makes the best advertisement for himself. Uh, then we have Susan Tönsmann. Susan is a director of the Zurich uh, Academy of Participatory Science. This is, she will She's organizing, she's initiating uh, courses here in Zurich, I'm in Zurich, to uh, how to do citizen science, uh, what do students have to learn to become fluent, and uh, also uh, how to attack uh, citizens to come. <clears throat> Our next participant is Loretta Carugeline, if I say it right, uh, from uh, Lithuania. She's an ombudsperson for academic ethics and procedures in the Republic of Lithuania. She's an expert on uh, challenges that can come from ethical or legal side and which are issues in citizen science. And then we have Alexander, who, whom you just heard, who spends a quarter of his body uh, not to move, but to do open science, uh, if you remember his first slide. Uh, okay, so my idea was to have a few questions that came up, come up while you do citizen science, while you try to initiate citizen science. Uh, and I would ask them to the panel, uh, 
the, probably some of these questions have uh, been already put on the uh, question and the answer session, and I hope I can cover some of your questions, but maybe at the end later on we will have <clears throat> time to see this directly. So my first question uh, is more general one goes to primarily to Muki. What do you see as the advantage of citizen science over uh, other science? How to convince small researchers? and the public to engage in them? And what have you experienced are the greatest hurdles? So as, as I mentioned towards the end of the presentations, there are things that, that are simply impossible to do or will be very, very complex to do about getting into people's homes and backyards and collecting information within that. That's a line from Karen Cooper from North Carolina State University that people's backyard are one of the most inaccessible places for science. And it's actually a very, once you kind of think through it, it's, it's a really good point. Um, there are also uh, the uh, uh, ideas, as especially when we are carrying out geographical research with communities, you get insight and interpretation about uh, information that you see. So for example, you observe that people don't use one bus stop and tend to use another bus stop. And if you are an external researcher, you'll start to try and come with hypothesis why that happened. If you ask someone locally, they'll tell you that in one of the bus stops, there, are, there was a lot of mugging and they feel safer to go out in the second one and you got your answer. So that's another way in which I know from experience that, that research can get better. Um, so there, and that there will be other, other things of that sort. So there are so many advantages of that. Now for researchers, it doesn't fit for every research project and every research area. It's, it's got its place to certain activity and when it's suitable, it should be considered. Okay, thank you, Muki. Uh, I would come with the second question to Suzanne. Uh, what kind of skills do you need to do citizen science? Who has these skills and how do you teach them? How do you bring them into the public and the university? Thank you very much, Daniel, and um, yeah, thanks everybody for um, for having this great discussion today. Um, in our work, we indeed focus on competencies and skills for citizen science, and the idea is that you need to have a specific skill set or or competencies to engage in science generally, um, and in citizen science in particular. And we like to think of skills and competencies in a broad sense. Um, so on the one hand, cognitive skills, so things that you can you can learn by, you know, by learning them, by reading, but also skills in the sense of um, um, a broader sense of um, that has an emotional component, a normative component, um, the ability to function in a group, um, to translate conversations sort of that, that are happening in a group. Um, because we believe that especially in, 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 in co-creation processes, um, there are different people um, that come to the table and, and Muki pointed to some, some great examples um, and people bring different kinds of skills. They also develop new kinds of skills. Um, and so we think that, that for instance, um, the skill to make things explicit um, rather than having them implicit, um, the kind of assumptions that people have, interests that they bring to the table, um, that is, uh, um, we think, an, an important um, skill to have in citizen science. Now, we also think that um, there are things that, you, that can be, be learned uh, that in a, in a university setting, you can, you know, you can take a course um, and work on your skills. At the same time, I think it is vital to um, to think of skills as something that is that is done in action. Yeah? You have to get active um, to cultivate skills and to kind of embody them, um, uh, integrated in your um, in your whole way of working. Um, so I think it is it is useful to think of, um, of 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 working and developing skills in a kind of you know um, action oriented way. So think of them as um, this is something that you do in action. 
and I think universities kind of provide settings for this, where people can try these things out. Um, they can work in, in, in smaller project groups, um, and they can they can learn also what feels comfortable to me. What you know, how is how can I work in a group, especially when you think of co-creation, um, uh, and what what kind of what can I learn? Um, what is maybe foreign to me? And I think that that citizen science provides a way here um, to to work and um, and and refine these these skills for for different kinds of people. Maybe I'll just stop here for, okay. for a first comment. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, so so some university have set up citizen science in some way, but usually it's separated from the main research activities. Uh, so how can you avoid that citizen science is just another thing in the university program and how to integrate it more in the setting of the university? I would like to ask uh, Alexander to comment on that. Uh, yeah, no, that's um, that's a very good uh, good question, and I think it's it's important to just in the same way that we are thinking about uh, adding open research as kind of and and avoiding having open research as kind of another thing. Uh, it's about opening the entire process and taking that as the norm, and also for citizen science to also be kind of thought of as kind of a, just a normal thing to do, and that that this should be really be integrated in everything we are doing, and and I also think it. Many universities develop policies kind of from a, from a kind of top-down uh, level, and you can always write uh, kind of a policy and a paper and, and say that now we have a, a policy, but you really need to also get researchers involved in this. So you need to have kind of a participatory design when it comes to kind of creating these things. Um, and I think it's, it's also very important to have within a university that the, the research administration, the IT section and the library, those three are critical to make this happen, in my opinion, in addition to the researchers, of course. Um, and, and it's really important to work together here because uh, I often see that, that people work on this kind of separately and then it's, it's not going to happen, in my opinion. And finally, we also need to remember the students, um, both coming, incoming students and also outgoing students are also citizens and are kind of the kind of the way we can really also really easily engage with with society at large. So that's also kind of one something we perhaps need to think about more carefully about when it comes to, to also citizen science. Do you would you say that incoming students put we start with projects on citizen science to learn to do science, absolutely to do research. Yeah, no, I, I would I would definitely say that that uh, mm -hmm. incoming students are great. I mean, they're coming from they are <laughs> they're, they're definitely coming coming directly from society and and uh, getting kind of experienced with with university thinking. Uh, so so it's a, it's a good starting point. But also the ones that we send out and use the alumni that we have in universities as kind of a bridge into into doing this as well. It's a it's a good way of doing it. I think. Okay, uh, I, I'm from Switzerland. We have a, a small country, and we have many people of very di no, different languages. And uh, to have a project of a reasonable size, you often need to overcome differences in regional differences and languages. Of course, other countries feel it much stronger. And I thought. Uh, Loretta could comment on that. What, how, how do citizen scientists work in different countries, in different regions, in different settings? And maybe you have some ideas, examples, how to do this. Thank you for the question. Uh, I'm going just to provide some examples from Eastern Europe and uh, giving this kind of linguistic variation is really exist. And it's also kind of a barrier to understand what the citizen science is. So for example, if uh, I look uh, at my home country, Lithuania, so definitely scientists don't get uh, what citizen science is uh, such as a term if we make a translation word by word. 
and it needs uh, more education by explaining this term uh, and definitely it's not easy to find a relevant translation of this term because for example our language is one of the oldest and it it doesn't evolve so fast by introducing new terms so this is quite a challenging thing uh, another thing that we also notice by observing what is happening in relation to student science in Lithuania is that we see that individual researchers, not institutions, they do some activity that we could name as citizen science, but they don't uh, figure out this by themselves. So this is also an issue that uh, sometimes they take this as a um, action research as an approach, but not as part of the citizen science. There are quite uh, many examples that we can find on Facebook by posting and inviting people to contribute to their studies. Uh, but in terms of the open science, uh, where we have some terminology and now there's some intentions to interconnect with the citizen science and give a better explanation of that. So this is still ongoing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the uh, related question, maybe but somewhat different, is to consider projects that go, say, over many countries or uh, over all of you, of course, which include the issue of language. And uh, I would like to ask Muki, who's in EXA in the European Association, how to do this, what is the advantage? Should one first start locally and then be international or the other way around? Uh, yeah, so what, what I've noticed from this experience at UCL in the, or the UK, where we still don't have a national actually network um, and by engaging with EXA is that they are complementary, they are not replacement. There is a need to work locally, so the process of reaching the point where we have the Office of Open Science and Scholarship was a process of, um, I don't know, five years plus of different discussions and different development that come together. The work in the UK is continued through different events and different groups coming together. And the same things with EXA from the early discussions in 2012 to a really active organization that just had a, a conference with 500 participants. And you get different things from different networks. So I would say you, you kind of need to think where to be in touch with those different networks and think what it is. It is very important, I would say, actually to start locally so to make sure that the, within the university the people who are interested are sharing the experience and then work upward but i'm a bottom-up person so i would say so wouldn't i mm -hmm. but uh, for certain questions don't uh, arise in certain countries for example to city on top of a Swiss mountain, you are less worried about bad air quality, but you are more worried about uh, people destroying the landscape from seeing. Yes. And uh, that's so that's various interests are. I agree. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, the next question goes to Suzanne. It, it's a question that I think I've been asked by many of you, I've said a few times in the questions, uh, what are the incentives and rewards that could lead to more citizen science? Thanks. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, one context in which we've been thinking about this this question um, is um, when we when we uh, organize and offer courses for students, and there a big concern was, oh, you know, you're offering a course, that's nice, but can I get a credit point for that or two? Um, so for the experience for us was really make it you know credit worthy, um, so that students have an incentive, and that at our university is. Um, 
uh, seems to be working well. Um, we 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 can um, we can offer credits. It has to be recognized by by the the faculty where where um, people study. Um, but but that is a a step that's that that I actually you know didn't really have on my agenda. I didn't think uh, you know didn't realize that it was this was important. But it is for students at a particular um, stage in their in their in their studies in their qualification process. For researchers, we've been um, experimenting with um, giving out seed grants, so a rather small amount of money. Um, but the idea being that with a small amount of money, you can create a motivation for a researcher to say, okay, I'll give it a shot. You know, I can, I can get money for it. I can, you know, this is a, a line I can put on my CV. Um, and then we'll, we'll see what, what happens um, with, with that project. And so there, and, and the experience there, um, I think it's too early to tell um, what has been, because it's really a seed phase. Um, but I, I think that with, small amounts of money that are used internally in a university, there is actually quite a bit of leverage that, that can be, be achieved. So it's, from my experience, it's, it's worth looking, of course, Muki pointed to the, to the issue of funding. You know, we should have, of course, you know, think of like big, you know, um, um, channels of, of funding. Um, but I think also the smaller ones, um, the giving out, you know, 20,000 euro, it can make a difference for an individual person to, to see, hmm, you know, this is a project that I could not have done otherwise um, without the involvement of, of citizens. Um, so I, I think that thinking about using small amounts of money in the right places can actually make a difference. And there might be room uh, in, you know, university's budget to, um, to try this out and, and, and see what happens. So I think it's really um, trying to think of the the recipients, you know, what are the motivations for them? For students, it's it's credits. Um, it is, of course, um, also a, a a question of having um, role models, you know, um, having uh, uh, senior researchers do, uh, engage in citizen science and see that you can publish and you can make a career um, out of citizen science. I think that is very important. Um, so, um, depending on what you know. The perspective that, that people have and, and the um, the stage that they're at, um, we will have to, to think about the right incentives that, that we can that we can provide and, and design for them. Uh, maybe this question I could go to all of you on the panel. Uh, would would you like to comment on that? There is for me also one incentive that Susan may not have mentioned is the incentive to the pres presidents and the leadership of the university. For instance, an incentive to give some money to citizen science project. Now, who would like to comment on that? Because that's a good uh, issue. But probably I would like to join uh, the discussion and uh, by adding that we definitely we have some discussions about the need to refocus the evaluation of research itself. And I think that uh, we also need to refocus uh, even researchers CV by, for example, uh, asking them to showcase whether they have open data sets, whether they have uh, some citizen science related activities done. So to make this kind of um, as an evidence of socially relevant research that they have done so far. Uh, so I think that what is going also discussed uh, very soon, and it's also a discussion on going at UNESCO level, that there is a, a draft of the recommendation for open science, and they suggest a lot of things that relate to citizen science, to, participatory, to participatory research in general sense. And I think that if we just come out with some uh, suggestions, what should be suggested to, to testify open science as well as citizen science, probably that would also change evaluation of research. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, and also on that, so from again, the experience that, that I covered on UCL, the, the, there was a need to continue and raise the different points um, and about the potential like what Alexander was raising on uh, the issue of, for example, engaging undergraduate, you can engage different people at different levels. I, for example, didn't mention a project in the chemistry department where undergraduate students are creating 
uh, diffusion tubes, then taking it to school as a public engagement activity. And then that is being used for measuring air quality and being used as a material for the students to do their first analytical chemistry activity. Um, in other cases, it can create opportunities for reaching out to alumni. So instead of just reaching them out and telling them something about their, depart their past department, there is an opportunity to actually engage them in the research in that department. That's something that a lot of people didn't have experiences under undergraduate and might be exciting for them. So it needs to continue and raise those different opportunities and uh, aspects and my general aspect also when I'm writing that in research proposal is always to think about all the other things that are important for people within their strategic objective uh, beyond just the citizen science. Alexander, yeah, uh, would you like to comment? Yeah, I think the others have said very good things and just want to pick up on the point made by Loretta there on, on, on having also then uh, the evaluation of researchers and, and uh, what you are uh, outputting. We also need to think about then the kind of the research process more and also, also trying to figure out how we can document these type of, of activities and also uh, reward them uh, and also think about it when we hire people and promote people, uh, etc. Uh, so, so we the researchers also feel that they actually get credit for doing this type of, of work, and that it's not just considered as, as kind of something secondary. I, I think just just to follow up on that, I totally agree, and I and I think that um, we we had a, a citizen science winter school here in, in Zurich in January, and we talked about like what you know what is what is. Um, difficult, especially for early career researchers, to to engage in citizen science. When you say you you know, you have a like time plan that you kind of you know might might uh, you know there might be delays and so forth. And the overall issue that that really came out is that they were also at looking at an academic culture that is really not conducive to these. Um, you know, the time my time delays. You might fail. You know, a pro a group might not function. A um, and the, these kind of things. So. And I think we, we see um, a overall shift in the academic culture, um, also in, in the open science, and the and as, and as you say, the 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 kind of um, issues that that people are you're assessed by, you know. Um, and 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 I hope that we're moving towards a situation where. Um, um, you know, engagement um, with society in a very broad sense and, and citizen science is not seen as a kind of a nice to have, but it's like, this is part of your job, you know, you should be doing this. Um, and it's a good thing. It's a, it's a, it's a plus if, if, if you do this. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks a lot. Uh, maybe the last city science is often considered a part of open science as Alexander has shown us. On the other hand, some of the practices of open science and China, they fail data. How do you think uh, Alexander would uh, is adversity benefit from citizen science? And what do you I, I think I lost the question there, Daniel. Uh, could you repeat, please? Yeah, and, and maybe stop your video, Daniel. Maybe it would yeah, be better look, uh, for the network. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, the question was, Citizen science and open science people count citizen science as part of open science. Uh, no, but open science is also any other research. Now, how, what of these uh, practices of open science? Most 
I, I think I got the gist of that question kind of being whether kind of open science is kind of uh, the same as, as or kind of in, uh, part of of, uh, of citizen science or if citizen science is part of open science. And I guess it, it really depends on how you, you look at it. Uh, so so in the way that I, I showed in, in my presentation, I, I'm thinking about it as it can be kind of just one part of, of open science as such, if you think about it as more kind of data collection. But personally, I think it's more about also kind of really opening the entire process and involving citizens in all different parts of, 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 of the, the research, where when it comes to also, for example, using different types of tools, etc. So then you, you're getting a, also back to the question of training that Susanna was talking about earlier, and to what, what extent you train people or you provide tools in such a way that that citizen can actually help. But um, but personally, I, I'm thinking about trying to open the open this uh, as as much as possible and, and involve citizens at all steps, really, in in the the, the research process. Okay, good. Thank you all for to the question. We will share the, the responsibility that this works or does works well. Please, Irina. Thanks a lot, Daniel. I suggest to have a look uh, at our Q and A because we have some questions and comments, and then uh, we'll uh, have a look at Mentimeter. Thanks a lot for answering that, sir. So there is a comment from uh, Katya Yegorova. Uh, thank you so much for this insightful discussion, given that citizen science builds upon certain research traditions, for example, participatory methodologies. How do you motivate uh, those engaged uh, in that research, uh, for example, participatory map mapping in the context of geographical information science to rethink their line of work in relation to citizen science? I'm a citizen science researcher responsible for consolidating citizen science related activities. Uh, and I'm sometimes confronted with question of the type, how is citizen science different uh, from what I'm doing? Why sh what should I rebrand? Thank you. So any, any advice yes. to researchers yeah. on that? So, so there is the, the, the practical and the methodological reasons to do it. So that's, that's a problem that actually exists within the citizen science community. And if you'll Google around a paper by Aitzel et al, that called uh, Citizen Science uh, Terminology Matters, which actually look at those different terminologies and the way that it's being described in different fields. So by using citizen science, first of all, you have, what happened is that almost all the researchers who were involved in participatory research were marginalized within their own discipline and they have limited ability to access funding or to access networks that will enable them to reach out and do much more research. So, city, so by, by using the term citizen science just for their application and saying that it's a citizen science activity, they're opening the opportunities for funding, they're opening the opportunities to learn methodologies from related area. So learning, for example, from a researcher in geography by someone from public health, which without this common terminology would not known, your paper will be found in an easier way. Continue to call it whatever you used to call it and continue to engage with that community, but you can engage with other communities. And you can, um, and the fact is that in many cases, you use it for certain aspects of your activity and not for everything else. So the term is not perfect. People recognize that there are some issues even with the term itself in the US. There are lots of people who are arguing around the term citizen within the citizen science, but it's now established into regulations as I demonstrated in Horizon Europe. So use it for the advantage of your area and to reach out. Thanks a lot. And um, there is uh, a question from uh, Mika Sterk and um, 
Uh, if you introduce a new evaluation system with increased focus on socially relevant research, how would you correct for a potential bias between research that it is in itself already socially relevant or needs uh, the collaboration with citizen science with citizens versus research types that don't really benefit from it sir, other than from outreach effect. For example, astronomy versus healthcare or physics and mathematics versus sociology or environmental sciences. Anyone would like to comment on that? Uh, I could uh, just start probably, maybe some, uh, someone else would uh, like to compliment. Uh, to my understanding, the research itself is not a socially relevant research. That's why we have unpublished papers, unpublished research reports. And for some reason, then when we switch uh, on peer review, somehow for different reasons, uh, they are not... Um, can or cannot be treated as an output so what has been done by the researcher. So I would probably would suggest by discussing how each of us understand the research itself. Is it really uh, socially relevant research? Because we as scientists, as, though, as researchers must do research because this is part of our profession, let's say this. And uh, if we refocus, so there's kind of a lot uh, of things and evidence that, that the research activity was refocused. And I think that suggesting an improving research evaluation uh, system, it uh, would be more, let's say it would be better for researchers to uh, name everything what they do uh, every day, in everyday activity. So if I come back to my country's examples, we have some scientists who do citizen science but they do not name it as it is, as it is defined. However, what we try to do is uh, not to change the research evaluation system at this, uh, this stage, but to try to accommodate citizen science in their thinking. And uh, by doing this, we definitely explore what the general situation is just to bring evidence for policymakers and also to give a support by developing guidelines, for example, how to ensure research integrity in doing citizen science. So we take um, a different perspective, not starting from the research evaluation uh, instantly, but trying to step by step to go into the system and, and encourage scientists to do this science, since it's also or part of the open science is going to be soon. And it's more often discussed that it's, uh, it should be part of the open science. So I think that uh, if we support open science, we definitely should be supporting uh, citizen science with the same extent. And can I add just a thought um, on this, the, the question of the social relevance? I find it interesting to, um, to, um, to, to think of you know what what are the terms um, that we use and the concepts that, that we um, that we think about, and for social relevance, I would I would like to suggest that we can also think of project in terms of impact. What is the impact of, of projects? Um, and we we at the participatory science academy work with this this um, this um, impact logic, and the idea is to think what kind of an impact does a particular project have in research? So what does it add to science? But also what does it add to society at large and also individual people. I think there are projects uh, and it doesn't matter what topic it is, it can have a very large impact on individual people, their sense of being, their sense of empowerment, their kind of you know making sense of the world. So I think there can be a very deep impact um, and it doesn't really matter what, what the project is, whether it's transcribing Bentham or you know, um, uh, measuring air quality. Um, so it's, um, you know, when, when you look at this from, from an impact logic, I, I think that you, we, we can see more uh, and it opens up a new way of, of thinking about, um, about what, what science can, can do for individual people. Could I also just add on a little bit uh, there? I, th I think it's also very important to, to consider that um, impact, as, as Susanna just said, uh, comes in many different forms. I mean, it can be kind of more immediate uh, impact from also more applied types of, of research, but then 
uh, I'm a big favor of, of, of having uh, of doing basic research and, and uh, also there you may talk about an impact that may take a little bit longer, but still kind of the, the whole point of, of opening the process is to not only focus on the results of the research and kind of the final conclusion, but also to open the how we do these things and how we develop the knowledge uh, within the research. And I think that part is something that we can definitely uh, develop uh, into citizen science projects in any field, really. I mean, after all, we are, I, I guess everything that's done in a university is done because we believe in it somehow, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of the job of, of university employees and university leadership is to do meaningful things in both in research and in education. So, and I think every, everything can really also be turned into a citizen science project if you just think carefully about it. In fact, many of the coolest citizen science projects I've seen, I mean, are coming from, from fields where that you would not think about at all as kind of being relevant at all, but they are super cool and they get really good help from citizens uh, in their research. Thank you. And um, there is also a comment from uh, Mika Sterk and uh, from my experience with the European project Britec with partners in Poland, Greece, Belgium and Spain, Spain, I learned that especially differences in legal issues, for example, privacy between countries can make the administration of a citizen science project more complex. And it's not really a question, but rather an observation to add to uh, Mr. Genia's answer. So I don't, I don't see any unanswered questions yet. So I suggest to have a look at Mentimeter. And uh, oh, sorry, Irina, mm -hmm. can I just share my observation to this observation that you just <laughs> sure, had? please, please, please do. Uh, to my oh. mind, there is an, there is not an issue of privacy, but there is a issue of the compliance with GDPR in the European countries, because it's a new and not uh, probably all countries are ready to get into this with the research data. Another uh, problem, and I would say a huge problem, is that not all European um, countries have the same practice related to ethical review of research that covers also privacy issues. So I think if we would have more homogeneous system about the ethical review, we would get more experience about uh, the compliance with GDPR. I think these uh, problems should be minimized. Thanks a lot. Um... So please uh, keep writing your questions in the Q&A if you have any, uh, if you have any comments or if you'd like to share something, uh, please raise your hand and uh, we'll uh, let you speak uh, and uh, make a thanks. Uh, so now let, let's have a look at Mentimeter results and maybe uh, talk a bit about uh, them. Mm -hmm. And thank you everyone who responded. So I hope uh, you can see my slides. Uh, and please help me, Emily, if someone will be raising hand, hand to comment. Uh, so we okay. have 72 people who engaged. And once again, uh, if you want to, you can see menti.com and uh, code A257153. So, uh, 39 answers that researchers do talk, 40 answers already <laughs> that researchers do talk uh -huh. uh, about open science uh, at uh, institutions. And then, no, don't know. So I don't know, probably here. There is not much to comment. Uh, oh, you, you could comment that uh, in a way that in a workshop like this, where I guess people are particularly interested in this topic, since you're coming to this workshop, then then even though only about half of the people actually say that it's it's being talked about in the university, that's, uh, that shows that we need to talk more about it, I think. Thanks. Then the next, next question we asked, uh, whether your institution strategic plan includes citizen science uh, and uh, there are 26 responses, yes. And uh, maybe if you have a link to that strategic plan and you could post it in a chat, then we'll add it to, to the workshop page because uh, that would be really interesting to, to see how, how you do that or if, if you'd like to comment a bit uh, about that question. So if you answered yes, and if you would like to say a little bit how you included uh, citizen science in your institution strategic plan, please raise your hand and we'll be, we'd love to hear from you. 
And also please get in touch because in January, there is a new project called Time for CS, Time for Citizen Science, which is about institutional abilities to integrate uh, citizen science within different organization. And we will collect at UCL different case studies and uh, do analysis on them. So please also email me uh, with this information. Thank you. And I see one raised hand, so let me allow to speak. So you you you, you can you can speak now if you want. Oh, hello, uh, hello from Brno, Czech Republic, Masaryk University. Actually, we are now in the development of new open science strategy, and it will be discussed tomorrow, actually, in the afternoon, you know, with our, our researchers, etc. And we prepared a strategy for open access and also for fair data. And the question for tomorrow, you know, after we go all this process, you know, will be, okay, should we include citizen science or not, you know? And uh, we hope that, yes, because it makes sense. And the city of Brno has actually uh, some kind of city uh, city scientific officer, you know. So we are in the talks with the city, you know, to stabilize this also for the on the city level. And I will talk uh, about it also tomorrow during my lighting talk. So uh, I would like to invite you for that also. So thank you very much and looking forward to work with you in future. And we will get in touch with UCL to be part of that if it is possible. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Jim. I don't see any other raised hands. So maybe we can go to next question. Um, uh, does your institution support citizen science activities? Sir? And I see 37 answered yes. And uh, if you would like to comment sir, how you support, sir, and you can drop a line in the chat or again, please raise a hand and uh, speak uh, because it would be interesting to hear how you provide this kind of institutional support. And then uh, next question was uh, about uh, citizen science project at your institution and uh, 42 answered yes, sir. So again, if, if you were were one of those who said yes, sir. And if you'd like to mention examples of the citizen science projects, sir, please speak up uh, or add them in the chat. And I see Raul raised the hand. Uh, so I'll stop sharing and uh, uh, you could talk now, Raul. It's okay now? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, we are from the Citizens uh, Science Project, Cities, Cities Health, and uh, we have developed this project, uh, for example, as um, and we have a new toolkit that I think it will be very interesting if you go, I, I can send you by the chat, is the name is Cities, um, Citizens Science Toolkit .au, Citizen Science Toolkit .au, and then you can share your best practices on citizen science here is uh, at your story you go to the and then you can put um, uh, be you can be part of this toolkit sharing the best practices on on um, citizen science uh, we want uh, having this uh, useful toolkit to share best practices on different topics not only in the, the main um, subject of the project, that the project is about air pollution, urbanism, uh, and, uh, uh, environmental issues and health, but uh, the toolkit is for all the um, citizen science projects, not only environmental and health uh, issues. Mm -hmm. Thank I you, Raul. Fine, interesting, thank you. Thanks for Thank sharing you. that. And I see a question from Ravia in the Q&A and Ravia is from uh, Islamic University of Gaza and she's doing a lot of excellent open access projects. So, so her question is, is it possible to extend uh, citizen science uh, in Europe to involve developing countries in the process, sir? Would someone like to comment about that? Sir? What are the opportunities sir, 
Yes, so, so you've seen in, in uh, my project, the, the project that we're doing as part of it that uh, is, um, is happening and in different developing countries, there are at least two other ERC projects that engage with people in different parts of the world. There are also, as I mentioned, an association growing up in different areas. So the Spanish community got a really strong links to the Latin America uh, community, something called WICAP, and they can work with them on different projects. Um, and there are also uh, joint up activities with India and in South Asia. So there are plenty of opportunities to do the project. They require the appropriate mechanisms. And there is also a, a very, very long legacy going back to the 70s of participatory activities like participatory rural appraisal and participatory learning and action that we should uh, learn from and integrate. And now even in European projects, so it's important to say that, in, for example, within the Green Deal uh, call that is currently circulating and people are preparing for it, the, uh, there is a special attention to work with African countries and there is a whole thing growing there about citizen science. So absolutely possible and uh, interesting area to work with. If I could also just add in there is, is that I see that now also with particularly after the, the pandemic, uh, everything is, is happening online and that also makes it, of course, much easier to, to think more globally about doing also citizen science. In fact, the last music labs that we have been running have been online event with participation from all over the world. And, and uh, so that's that's really, I mean, global by by design. Of course, uh, it, you may also need to kind of change some of the research questions and, and the way you think about conducting the research, of course, then uh, also thinking about uh, ge ge geographical location, cultural uh, differences, etc. But that should then be embedded into the research design, I think, to, to make it uh, relevant. Thanks a lot. I don't see any other questions or raise hands. So maybe we can go back to, to the Mentimeter. So next question was about uh, some examples of citizen science projects uh, in institutions. And um, uh, there are some uh, links uh, we'll uh, add uh, these examples uh, to the workshop page. So thanks a lot for adding them. Um, so, so you can see some examples. Visit to supercomputer facilities um, and high performance computing, uh, open journal of mathematics and physics. Uh, maybe if someone is from this open journal of mathematics and physics, you can comment uh, how, how you involve uh, citizens. That would be interesting to hear. Um, water lab, linguistics, uh, several projects uh, for primary and secondary schools, and some examples, citizen lab. Anyone would like to comment on those examples? And then the next, next question was about uh, a central unit in your university responsible for citizen science. And uh, we have six yes responses. And maybe if you could say, uh, I don't know, maybe type in a chat or raise a hand and speak up, which unit is that? Because I think that that's interesting uh, from, from an institutional perspective. Um, if you could also then add there is also a question of whether there should be a central unit or if this should be kind of more embedded into the, the university at, at large but then if so how and, and that's also an interesting question I think yeah that's, that's actually a very good question <laughs> Because was it was it a central unit or was it really embedded uh, in all uh, in, in faculties in library in ICT like it was mentioned? And Inga, please uh, you you raised your hand. Yeah, um, I wanted to add um, to this question. 
indeed, is there a need of a central unit? But Alexander, you mentioned uh, we need uh, IT department, library, the several units in uh, the university to support this and to work together with the researchers on this. But if there is no central unit, how, how do you do it? How do you approach it to make sure that it's there? And that's the first question. And the second question is more going to, to Muki. Um, you have this um, research center for citizen science. Um, what, how was it induced? How did they start it at? How was the concept there? Okay, we can do this and we can go along. So it's, it's a two way question. It's the central support on, on the one hand. And secondly, how do you get to such a research center? So the research center came out so that's why i've shown the, the work i'll start from that because that thing you've seen it's a story of 20 years and i can share the bruises and the whole experience it's actually been that's why i'm so much highlighting the budget um i'm sometimes even talking about the hypocrite syndrome which is different from the imposter syndrome that when you're writing research applications that are about say human computer interaction or technology where what you really want to progress is the participatory methodology and at the moment the, the fashion is on one thing so you write the application in the right way you deliver on what it is so it's not that you're not delivering of, on what the application is but you couldn't explicitly talk about participatory activities and it's been a huge pleasure to live actually in a situation where you can apply for citizen science and say that that's what you are doing it's been a huge difference in terms of well-being and feeling about that. So it was a long story about developing this area, starting from the margin and slowly noticing how different activities are, are integrated into it. Also for a, quite a while, a long period, I was acting as the university unit for that in the sense that people were getting in touch about project where they said, I have a participatory part, can you, please support me in this activity. And I kind of engage with different activities, which is why I have now links with the public health, with, um, with people in human computer interaction, with people in physics, chemistry, and all the rest of it. The process of creating the university center emerged from once the discussion on, on open science evolved, then there was this championship from the library and the amazing activity. I, I always have to mention it of what Polaris done with UCL Press, which is outstanding in, in providing such a fantastic support for open access publications. But then as open science discussion emerged into also including citizen science that created an opportunity to work together and start building up the center. And because we already had communities and links and other things, and you've seen that there were already things happening in the background, it was possible to kind of demonstrate to the uh, management and the university, hey, we are doing all this work. This is getting attention at policy level. There was the Lero report that Daniel wrote and other things like that, that helped the process in uh, getting it. So for people on this call, you don't need to go through all this trouble. You now have exactly what I mentioned earlier. You have the regulations, you have the calls of Horizon Europe, you now have the level report, you'll have other examples and you should just go for it. I would like to, <clears throat> to, to ask you a question. Uh, I may add one. Oh, go on, uh, Daniel. I may add one point here. Many years ago, when we started this, we recognized immediately that there should be kind of a central unit, namely to attract people from outside. If every researcher looks for his own citizens, we never get anywhere. So there is an advantage of uh, whatever you call it, a common gate, a, com a common portal, to citizen science at the university, which can be, as Muki said, used for policy, but in fact, just for attracting uh, citizens. Thank you, Daniel. And please, Jean-Pierre. 
Yes, just uh, <clears throat> first of all, uh, thank you very much for your presentation, uh, which was very, very interesting, I think. But uh, at this time, <clears throat> I still have a, a lot of questions for sure concerning uh, citizen science. You expressed a lot of uh, questions concerning the, the quality, the motivation, the assessment, uh, the integrity, etc., etc. It's uh, very, very important. But my, my, my main question is how could we sure that uh, citizen science contribute really to the trust of the society uh, in science? Uh, and I think uh, in our society where uh, the fake news, the uh, <coughs> social networks, etc., cetera, uh, give a lot of false uh, information, uh, do you think that uh, citizen science allow to uh, encourage uh, the confidence, the trust uh, of the society in uh, science? It's a very general question, sorry. <laughs> no answer, okay. Uh, I mean, this was originally, of course, meant as one of the main uh, reasons for doing city science. And uh, I we, uh, we don't have a, uh, statistics on that, but clearly people who have been involved in projects uh, have been very positive about it. And, uh, I believe that it is a, a positive development here. Maybe too small to act against conspiracies, that works much easier, but uh, I think there is a positive effect here, already visible. Uh, I look at my watch and uh, it seems that we have come to, to the end uh, of the time a lot. But of course, uh, Inge and uh, Irina might uh, give you more time. But otherwise, I would just think we have a discussion, I believe. Uh, many questions, thank for all the questions. I, I lose my uh, head looking at the questions and looking at you. Uh, I would like to give back to Inge or to Irina to say a few wise words to the end. Thank you. And uh, maybe to make a, again a bridge uh, with open science, uh, I think uh, if uh, this citizen science process is participatory and open, and if everyone can uh, really go to the source and fact check, uh, I think that that's also a tool to fight misinformation. Uh, and we, we already see this happening with preprints when uh, preprints are really discussed and uh, some of them are retracted when uh, uh, feedback and peer review is provided. Sir. So that's another reason why we decided to merge citizen science and open science into one workshop. Because uh, for us, that's an important topic. And uh, over to you, Inge, for final words, sir. And thanks again, everyone. Uh, very interesting. Yeah, so this was the, the first part of our two day workshop tomorrow morning. Uh, we have another session starting. Uh, at 10, where we actually will have uh, two panel discussions, uh, two panels, well, discussions, panels. Uh, one is on a Bar the Barcelona case, where we uh, will discuss how a city and a university together um, take part in uh, citizen science. And then we'll have an open air session where we will highlight the activities in open air around citizen, say, citizen science enabling open science. And we have a few lightning talks because we want to give the word to the people out there who are also uh, in this call to show what they are doing in their own countries and their own uh, uh, institutions. So I hope to see you all again tomorrow. Have a nice day and uh, see you tomorrow. Bye. And there is one more question in uh, the last question in the Q&A okay. from, from Shimon. Uh, I wonder if there is a need uh, for a special license for crowdsourced, 
crowdsource data set made by multiple people, which will save the data integrity. Yes. yes, there is. It's called Open Database License, and it's the license that is being used by OpenStreetMap. It was created by OpenStreetMap for the community and it's from a bottom-up project so you got it there thank you so much thanks again everyone uh, have a wonderful day and uh, hope to see you tomorrow and um, like i said we'll make uh, all the links uh, recording slides etc available on uh, this workshop page so uh, thank you and see you tomorrow bye Bye.